and welcome to Stories of Scotland, a podcast which wonders the zigzagging paths of Scottish heritage and nature. I'm Jenny, a happily lost mountain goat. Meh. And I'm Annie, a hopelessly lost archivist. Help! And today we're going to be having a blather about one of my favourite mountains. Yes! Geology episode! Strap in, people. This is about to rock your world! Which is made of rock, so it's gonna rock your rock. Rock? Rock! (laughs) (laughs) The Monroe we're talking about today is one rich in myths of magic, fairies, folklore, and legend. And even more exciting, for me at least, is that its unique shape and characteristics helped 18th century scientists unlock secrets of the natural world. It is, of course, Shehalian, a very romantic mountain. And I'm so excited about this episode because I think it's good for the soul to have a look at such a magical place. So let's begin with a lovely poem I found from 1897, written by a mysterious poet, initialed F.H.T., and published in the Westminster Gazette. Jenny, on you go. Far the grey loch runs up to Shehalion, lap, lap the water flows, where my wee boaty rose, greenly a star shows, over Shehalion. She that I wandered with over Shehalion, how far a yacht your ken crags of the merry glen, strayed she that wandered then down fra Shehalion. Sail of the wild swan turn to Shehalion, here where the rushes rise, lo the dark hunter lies, beat thou the pure skies back to Shehalion. Thanks, Jenny. That was gorgeous. So, Shehalion is a Munro, and for those who aren't in the Munro know, Munros are Scottish mountains over 3,000 feet. So that's over 900 metres for normal metric people out there. They're named after Hugh Munro, who was inspired to compile this list of all of Scotland's mountains over 3,000 feet, and then publish them in the Journal of the Scottish Mountaineering Club. And it's a really common hobby here in Scotland to Munro bag. This means that you spend years of your life, weekend after weekend, decade upon decade, slowly but surely, stitching together a bag large enough to fit a Munro in it. Oh, Jenny, tell the (laughs) truth. (laughs) Fine, fine, fine. (laughs) Munro bagging is the process of climbing every one of the 282 Munros in Scotland. And once you've done them all, you curl up in a ball at the top of the last one and you turn into a pile of sherbet. I mean, I'm not sure the thing about the sherbet is true. Why, why would you become sherbet? I don't know. If you follow us on Instagram, you'll be witnessing my own slow attempt at doing this, but I'm in no rush. Um, the mountains aren't going anywhere and I'm not a huge fan of sherbet. Why don't you turn into something other than sherbet then? I don't make the rules. Human Monroe does. <laughs> All right then, so let's get back to the facts, the (laughs) non-Sherbet related facts. What does Shehalion actually mean? Well, the most common translation we've come across is the fairy mountain of the Caledonians. The Caledonians were a Celtic tribal confederacy, so to meet them we need to go back to the end of the Iron Age, around 100 Common Era. Caledonia isn't one unified place, but rather many Celtic tribes who are united against the Romans who themselves are attempting an invasion of Scotland. So with Shehalion being called the fairy mountain of the Caledonians, this implies that it is a really important place for the Caledonians. And it's easy to see why. Shehalion is an almost perfect triangular cone, standing alone and defined against the rolling Perthshire landscape. However, there's another translation of Shehalion that I absolutely adore. Is it the unreferenced Celtic scholars in the Dundee Courier of 1879 who claimed Shehalion to mean maiden's breast? No, no, but (laughs) when I saw this, I do. I find it really creepy that any scholar would look at absolutely any mountain and say, hmm, this has to be a breast, but not just any breast, particularly a maiden's breast. 
That's why I hike. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I find this alternative name from an oral history recording of a Perthshire man named James G. Scott. And we've got kind permission to use this from the School of Scottish Studies. So it was recorded in 1958. So this oral history is over 60 years old and the sound quality is going to reflect this. So we'll repeat the main points afterwards. So if you don't pick them up along the way, don't worry. However, I'm really, really excited to be sharing this oral history with our listeners because now it feels like you're coming into the archives with us. Watch out, there's loads of spiders and bones. Jenny, archives aren't haunted crypts. Well, what if there's loads of very well-preserved entomology collections and archaeological artefacts? Jenny, that's not an archive, that's just your hobbies. <laughs> <laughs> All right then, let's play the clip. You were up well, I'm not that. Oh, it's a lad. See, there, there's so much stuff about what uh, the, the, what uh, Shehalian means. Oh, I was up at the gate to a man one summer's day, and he, when we got to the top, it clouded over, you see, and I said to him, I think we'll get down to here, I, I, I don't fancy being here in a thunderstorm, it should be a bad storm. Oh, he said, I would love to, to witness that. And we stayed, we didn't, we didn't get the storm yet. It evaporated, they, it divided, Shehalian divided it. One half would up Loch Tay, and the other half would up Loch Ranach way. So when I came home, I met my grandfather, and he was a good Gaelic scholar. And I was telling him, why well, he says, don't you know, but they, don't you know your language? He says, that's what Shehalian means. The mountain that pacifies the storm. She is peace and had in the storm. The mountain that pacifies the storm. What do you think? It's interesting, very interesting. Well, what name had he got? When he said the name in Gaelic, how did he say it? Sheehan. Yes. Sheehan. Han. Ha, you, you say, Hadrochan. Yes. 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 You say yes. that. Yeah. That's a dro- there's to be a bad storm. And she is peace. Sheehan. I really love this translation from the classic unnamed Gallic grandfather, the mountain that pacifies the storm. But I also enjoyed the story of the two climbers at the summit of Shehalian, watching a storm approaching them and seeing the mountain divide it into two. But Jenny, does the weather really work like this? Yeah, no it can, definitely. If there's a, if there's a low storm rolling through and there's lots of vertical wind shear, um, which is when winds change direction with height, So if this is the case, then the top of the storm is carried in the direction of the upper winds, while the base of the storm is carried off in the direction of the winds closer to the ground. And this means that each storm then has half the energy it had before, and so will rain itself out sooner. Excellent, Jani. Thank you. Yay! Woman of all (laughs) rain knowledge. I had to take atmospheric science in university, and it was... fun. (laughs) Well, now I know that Shehalian can calm the storms. I'm ready to learn about the wonderful experiment of this mountain. This is the tale of an age-old question. One that humans have been asking for much longer than known time. Is it the secrets of the afterlife? No, Annie, no. This is a far more pressing query. Okay, just the the meaning of life, Jenny. It's even more philosophical than this, Annie. And it has a better punchline than why did the chicken cross the road? Because Shehalian is critical to an 18th century experiment asking the forever heavy question, how much does the world weigh? I'm not sure I want to know. It makes me nervous to think that we're just hanging around in the universe on a planet very slowly falling towards the sun. What difference does it matter what it weighs? Oh, but Annie, it does make a difference because we're all in this together. And this is a beautiful experiment because it's the first time the mass of the Earth was (laughs) measured somewhat accurately. The final result came within about 20% accuracy of our modern estimations. 
Wait, did they estimate 20% below or above the weight of the world? Mm, what does it matter? Because if someone guessed that I weighed 20% more than what I actually do, <laughs> then I would feel like a wonderful soft puffin, all feathered up and ready for the winter after fattening up on herring all summer. Maybe, <laughs> maybe go find another herring to podge up on for the cold. However... If someone guessed that I weighed 20% less than I do, then I would certainly be straight to the cupboard to eat a few extra pieces of shortbread until they assumed that I was a puffin. Wait, so if they think you're heavier, you're going to eat more herring, and if they think you're lighter, you're going to eat more shortbread. (laughs) A big part of living is just eating more every day, Jenny. All right, okay, well... I don't think the Earth is as self-conscious about her weight or even conscious of her weight. But by your judgment, our Earth can have some extra shortbread as our geologists underestimated her love handles. And actually, this project was a collaboration between physicists, mathematicians, geologists and astronomers. Nothing more wholesome than a big team project, right? Everyone working together in perfect harmony to make just one PowerPoint presentation. Wrong! They all hated each other by the end of it. Just like they do at the end of the PowerPoint presentation too. Well, that might be a little bit dramatic. But the results of the Shehalian project stoked the fires of the raging geological battle of the time. A battle between the Plutonites and the Neptunites. And it tipped the scales in favour of the Plutonites. See, this is the 1700s where so much of the natural world was still to be discovered, understood, and fought over. Just about the only thing that the various schools of geology could all agree on was that the Earth was round. Ah, if only they could see us now, Annie, as we fly through the universe on a frisbee that is Earth. Now the Plutonians, named after Pluto, the Roman god of the underworld, believed that the earth formed from the solidification of molten lava into igneous rock and all other rocks developed from this igneous rock via weathering, erosion, deposition, heat and pressure. The theory was born in the 1700s and developed by the famous Scottish geologist James Hutton in 1788. So is this why you have all the spiders and bones? Something to do with the Roman underworld? Yes. No, wait, 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 other... wait, wait. What's what's an igneous rock? So an igneous rock is a rock which has formed from solidifying from molten rock. So there's lots of different types of igneous rock. You can get anything that comes out of a volcano is an igneous rock when it hardens. But also if igneous rock hardens under the earth and it hardens much more slowly because it's much warmer under there than it is up on the surface then it crystallizes and you get things like granites and harder rocks. And that's an igneous rock. Thanks, Jenny. No problem. Now, on the other side of this war of abrasion, we have Abraham Werner and his pack of Neptunians. His theory of Neptunism, named after Neptune, the Roman god of the sea, thought that the Earth formed from a huge body of water, filled with suspended material that slowly settled out into sedimentary layers, which subsequently became sedimentary rock, like sandstones. But what a silly idea, Annie. What a confuddled pheasant, am I right? Where's all this water now, Werner? Hmm? Where'd it go? I mean, these are big questions about the world, Jenny. They're thinking about how the rock started. Where did it all come from? And the Plutonians think that it was a big molten ball of lava and slowly the crust has hardened and the inside is either also hardened rock or still molten lava because they could see volcanoes and say, well, this this rock is coming from somewhere. Whereas the Neptunites thought that the world started as a big ball of water in space filled with sediment. And slowly that sediment was pulled to the center of this ball of water and built out rock layers like an onion almost. So it would be rock all the way through, whereas the Plutonians thought there could be a big ball of lava with a thin crust on it, rather than a solid rock ball. Yeah, I'm understanding that now. Okay, brilliant. But the astronomers didn't really care about any of this geological infighting. They wanted to know the weight of the world so that they could figure out the weight of other astronomical bodies, such as planets, the sun, and all other fun stuff out there in the vast massiveness of space. 
one small stone for geologists, one massive planetary body for the astronomers. So essentially, if I know the weight of a tatty, I can figure out the approximate weight of a turnip. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. And it'll mean that eventually you know how big your whole turnip patch is, not just one turnip. But my turnip patch is massive, so let's get back to the questions of the universe. Yeah, just so everyone knows, Annie's turnip patch is huge. (laughs) (laughs) The weirdest of humble brags. (laughs) (laughs) And so to solve this question, the astronomers created the Committee of Attraction, which was formed to weigh their options and figure out the best way to conduct this mass if experiment. (laughs) And the first thing on their to-do list was to find themselves a big old mountain. So they brought in a surveyor named Charles Mason, the very same Mason who surveyed the Mason-Dixon line in America for any of our East Coast listeners over there. And so Charles was employed by the Committee of Attraction to spend a summer travelling around the UK scouting for the best mountain to use for their experiment. She had to be tall, strong, symmetrical, funny and good with money. And Mason picked the belle of the ball, the stunning, symmetrical, fiscally savvy Shehalian. I love that with the name Committee of Attraction, it sounds like they're trying to find a mountain to, you know, match make themselves with, to take out on a date and buy dinner. So why did they really pick Shehalian? Well, Shehalian was picked for a couple of reasons. The first was that she stands isolated in the surrounding landscape, and this reduces the chances of interference from other nearby mountains during the experiment. She also has an almost perfect east-west alignment, and this meant that calculations derived from bearings would be simplified. As well as this handy alignment, Shehalian also has an almost perfect conical shape, meaning that calculating its volume would be a much easier task than a big randomly shaped mountain teeming with peaks and corries and valleys. And finally, The steep north and south slopes meant that readings could be taken close to the mountain's centre of gravity. So the Board of Attraction has selected a suitably seductive mountain. (laughs) What exactly do they want it for? What is this experiment? Well, it all comes back to the brilliant physicist Isaac Newton, the man who first discovered gravity and built up many theories around its concept. And I'm not going to lie, Annie, gravity is really hard to describe and explain. And this podcast is about Scotland. So I'm sure there's a Stories of Physics podcast out there if you want more detail on gravity. But what matters for this experiment and this podcast is that all things with mass have gravity. We both have mass. And so we both have our own personal gravities. But as we are pretty small in the grand scheme of things, Our gravity is so tiny it's undetectable. But you know what's not small? The amount of love that everyone has for Dolly Parton. Um, yes, no, that's true. That is not small. That is massive and probably has a fair whack of gravity itself. But this is the 18th century, a few years before Dolly was born. And although they didn't have Dolly Parton, they did have a ginormous mountain. And according to Newton's laws... Bigger mass means bigger gravity, which means bigger gravitational pull. Now, Shehalian is actually pretty small in the grand scheme of things, but it's just big enough that in the 1700s, for the first time, they had devices sensitive enough to measure its gravity. And if its gravitational pull could be measured, plus its volume and thus its mass calculated, then from these values, the weight of the world could be extrapolated. Wow. And so, in the summer of 1773, they set to work on a two-pronged experiment. On the left prong, we have the mathematicians and surveyors carefully surveying the entire mountain. They recorded thousands of precise measurements all over the mountain, and using triangulation, they were able to determine its volume. Now, this took years to complete fully, The surveying was carried out by a rather disagreeable fellow named Reuben Barrow, and the calculations were completed by a mathematician named Charles Hutton. Not to be confused with our Plutonite geology boy, James Hutton, 
However, geology was an important part of this process. Because once the volume of Shehalium was determined, then the quantity and density of the various rocks was required in order to estimate the total mass of the mountain. Now to make this as accurate as possible, Charles Hutton chopped the mountain into slices of equal elevation, and so he invented contour lines, the handy cartographic tool for visualising and conveying elevation that every good map should have. Ooh, so Shehalian is the first mountain drawn with contour lines. Yep, first time they were ever used. Mm, I did not know this, and I absolutely love map history. So, contouring is a shape-shifting trick used by makeup artists to disguise <laughs> the amount of heron that we've eaten when it's the run-up for winter. <laughs> but the original use of contour lines is to represent the mass and volume with lines in art and maps. Well, you never know, Annie. Perhaps after contouring Shehalian, Charles Hutton went home and contoured himself some Kardashian cheekbones and <laughs> long, shiny nose. <laughs> Well, there is probably more money in makeup than in maps. Well, as a professional map maker, Annie, yes. However, fortunately for all map makers, Jenny, Hutton was too busy admiring Shehalian. Yes, both admiring it in person and on paper. Now, the right prong of this experiment was the astronomer's prong. Their job was to measure the gravitational pull of the mountain. This was conducted by the Astronomer Royal himself, Reverend Neville Maskelyne. He set up large platforms two-thirds of the way up the north and south faces of the mountain. Each platform had a large frame on it, and from the frame they dangled long lead plumb bobs. So if you don't know what a plumb bob is, it's an ancient dangly measuring instrument. Just a weight on a string, really. It was made by the ancient Egyptians, and possibly earlier peoples too, but it's such a useful tool that it's still used today. And it's also the same thing that floats above a sim's head. I never played the sims. Oh, that's the only reason I knew what a plumb bob was before I went to university to study surveying, and they were like, this is a plumb bob, and the whole world clicked into place with me that day. So they dangled this plumb bob line, and knew that there would be two forces acting upon it. The first being the main gravity from the mass of the Earth, pulling it vertically down. And the second being the gravity from the mass of Shehalion, pulling it slightly off vertical. And when I say slightly, I mean slightly. It was tiny, tiny amounts. But over the summer, they measured this tiny deflection against the known and fixed positions of the stars, slowly but surely calculating Shehalion's gravitational pull. And so, when the two prongs of this experiment came back together, they knew the gravitational pull of the Earth, they knew Shehalion's gravitational pull, and they knew Shehalion's mass. And so from this, they were able to calculate the weight of the world. Wow. This is such an intricate experiment mm -hmm. that has so many different facets to it. Mm -hmm. I am truly amazed by it. <laughs> so, how much does our wonderful planet weigh, Jenny? They calculated the weight of the Earth to be 4.5 times 10 to the 24 kilograms, which translates to 4.5 million billion billion kilograms. Or, to translate this even further, 4.5 million billion billion bags of sugar. Whoa, Jenny, that's so much sugar. Imagine all of the shortbread. It could fill a whole planet. <laughs> yes, it could fill just about one Earth's worth of planet. <laughs> but it's way more sugar than anyone expected. And this is what sweetened the argument of the plutographers against that of the neptographers. See, the weight of the Earth was so much that they realised it had to be much denser in the middle than it is at the crust. And what's denser than the rocks of the crust? Metal. So they theorised, and now they had evidence for this theory, that the core of the Earth was a dense metal. Iron, to be precise. And that's just what's so amazing about this experiment. It allowed the scientists of the 1700s to peer 4,000 miles below the surface that they stood upon 
and say with confidence that there was iron down there. For reference, the deepest hole humans have ever dug is four miles deep. So this experiment allows us to look thousands of times deeper than we'd be able to do without it. Which is pretty amazing, huh? It's incredible, Jenny, because it, it's this one Scottish mountain, Shehalian, as a window into the middle of the world, a window into billions of years ago. I always feel like I'm meant to be the historian on the podcast, but then you come in with some deep time and I just feel very <laughs> overwhelmed by it. Yeah, you're like the little thin crust of history and I'm like the deep core of time. Uh, but because of this window that you speak of, Plutonites could say that the Earth wasn't sedimentary rock formed from sediment settling out of a planet of water, else the Earth would be far lighter than it is. And because of this window that you speak of, the Plutonines could say that the Earth wasn't sedimentary rock formed from sediment settling out of a planet of water, else the Earth would be far lighter than it is. Still, it took many more decades for the Neptuninis to give up the fight, and James Hutton was the Scottish geologist who used this evidence to build his grand theory of uniformitarianism, which is the backbone of all modern geology. But the Shehalian experiment wasn't just important in the war between the Plutita Way Already's and the Nepet in the Buds, will you? This experiment allowed for great advancements in mathematics, physics, and astronomy as it confirmed Newton's various laws of gravity and made lots of new lofty mathematical starry physicy things possible. Again, I'm sure there's a Stories of Physics podcast out there for you if you would like to know more. I don't get the joke of you calling the Plutonites and Neptunites slightly different things every time <laughs> so, you talk about them. So basically, there's no word for what they are. <laughs> so... <laughs> So it starts off with like Plutonites and then it goes to like Neptographers and, and then it just goes to Nebit in the Bud will use. <laughs> okay. That makes that and, makes perfect sense. Our like, listeners will come along with that story. It's gonna be that like two people are gonna get the joke, but I think it's funny. <laughs> <laughs> it's like when I called it the war of abrasion rather than war of attrition. That's like a really funny geology joke. <laughs> I don't get it. I don't get it at all. Abrasion is a massive part of geology and the formation of mountains. It's like a geological process. And attrition is, you know, World War II. So <laughs> the war of abrasion is just a pun on that. Okay. Uh. <laughs> so earlier you said that the result was 20% off. But we have better technology nowadays. So what is the current estimation of our Earth's mass? Well, the result was very good considering the precision of the technology they had at the time. But now we know that the Earth is 6 million billion billion bags of sugar, rather than 4.5 million billion billion bags of sugar. So they were about 20% too low with their estimation. But still, this is groundbreaking for science at the time and meant more shortbread for Mother Earth. Yay, Shehalian! Yay, Shehalian! And I've managed to find a poem of someone saying Yay, Shehalian for this <laughs> moment in scientific history, written in 1905 by John Sinclair, who saw Shehalian as a muse. On you go, Jenny. From physicist to poet, you're going to cover everything today. <laughs> oh, fair Shehalian, round whose lovely cone, this earth as on a steel yard one was weighed, while Rannoch open mouth beheld afraid the wondrous work that then was carried on. The wearer in his tent sat on a stone and viewed the secret awe, but undismayed, how by this mass his pendulum was swayed and made his calculations all alone. Twas this grand work in 1744 that spread thy fame over countries far and near, and rendered thy to men of science dear, as a landmark in astronomic lore. And so thou shalt continue to shine, linked with the name of the great Masculine. I really like this poem, just because it's name-dropping this royal astronomer, Masculine. 
But it's so inaccurate. It's giving him all of the credit for their group projects. And he made his calculations all alone. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. Charles Hutton, the mathematician, by far had the hardest job. It took him two and a half years. Two and a half years of his life to calculate the exact volume of Shehalyan. Everything incredible. else was done in a summer. <laughs> That's absolutely incredible. I am so mm-hmm. impressed with this, Jenny. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much. One last fun fact. I did say at the beginning that they all ended up hating each other. Ruben Barrow, the man who did the surveying, and Charles Hutton had a lifelong rivalry after this, hating each other. And Ruben Barrow was the assistant of Maskelyne. Um, and upon his death, it was found that he'd written all these sort of satirical slash just plain mean poems about them all. So, oh no. tore them apart. Drama. Drama. I'll hit the jingle before we get any more poems out. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> Now, after all of that rock talk, how do you feel about taking a wee hike up Shehalyan, Jenny? Oh, Annie, there is nothing I would love more. Brilliant. Well, this is an account from Joseph Gibson Scott, who was writing in the Scottish Mountaineering Journal about a climb that he did in 1885, though it was published a wee bit later because the journal didn't actually exist at that point. By this time, he had immigrated to New Zealand and was just incredibly nostalgic about his time in Scotland. So he really missed his homeland. So, Jenny, could you be a homesick Scot? And I'll jump in on the sound effects. Sounds good to me. Hey, Jenny, just before you get going, um, I need a pheasant noise and I couldn't find one that we could legally use. So could you be a pheasant for me? Um... <clears throat> Thanks. And the outlines of my memory become blurred and indistinct through the blue tobacco smoke. And the walls of my den fade away. And I hear the cheery voices and see the dear old faces and once again, I am back in Scotland. And oh, I see, I see the mountains. The great sky cleaving grey coned mountains, the quarries and the foaming fountains, and the white mists floating by. We seized every opportunity presented by a holiday for a hill ramble, and although the time was early April, and the snell east wind was roaring through the Edinburgh streets, and rain and sleet chilled us to the marrow, the word had gone round that Shehalyan was the objective, and thither we would go, despite all things. And so the night train whirled four of us, Campbell, Kirk, Macintosh, and myself, into the North Country. It was raining and sleeting at Stirling. It was sleeting and raining at Perth, but when we were deposited at 2am in pitchy darkness at Pitlochry, the weather was fortunately somewhat better. It was only sleeting. We discussed a meal of sorts over the fire in the porter's room at the station. Then we tumbled out into the mud and the murk, and we marched for Tummel Bridge. The day was breaking as we reached Kelly Cranky. The cold and gloom and blackness, and the sullen roar of the swollen river Gary. Owls were hooting dismally in the leafless woods. The new direction of road, however, soon brought us into more cheerful surroundings. The hoot of the owl gave place to the crow of the pheasant. The light grew stronger. Over in the east, a tawny orange leaped into the sky. And the opening glen and rising mist showed us the hills well whitened with snow. Ascending for a few yards through the woods, what a glorious scene burst upon us. From our feet, the ground plunged straight down to the river, 
three hundred feet of rugged descent. It was not the boisterous river that had been our companion for the last few miles. It was calm and broad and sinuous, winding its way through grass meadows and past clumps of leafless trees that looked as though they had stolen forward from the company of their fellows on the opposite hillside to admire their graceful forms in the mirror of the water. There was the old ferry boat, drawn half out of the stream in a little creek. There, the tumble-down boathouse. And there, the path winding through the fields to the ferryman's white cottage. Beyond the curves of the river, The eye rested on the loch, visible throughout every furlong of its length and breadth, its shores of alternate wood and green pasture, its bold rocky capes, its cottages, farms and country seats, and the snow-dappled hills surrounding it. High above the rocks and the woods towered the mountains beyond, Faragon, with sharp graceful summit and the mighty bulk of our objective, Shehalian, a huge volume of white mist resting on her snowy shoulder and streaming far across towards the northern hills. There was not a trace of life in the landscape, not a man nor a beast nor a bird to be seen, not even a wreath of smoke from the roof of a cottage. All was lonely. For four miles our road now leads us along the north side of the loch, for the most part through charming scenery. The sun was now up and shafts of gold were gleaming along scour and woodland. Primroses were peeping out the banks. Soon the birds commenced to twitter, and from the loch came the clamour of the great white gulls. Rabbits were gambolling on every part of Greensward, and out of every other field were the merry brown partridge. Man alone was absent. Not a soul was stirring yet, except ourselves, of course. At the head of the loch, we again meet the Tummel River, pouring through a wide glen that grew more lonesome as we ascended. Big boulders strewed the slopes. The birches were stunted and twisted, the bogs black and forbidding. And in front, heaving higher into the air as we drew nearer her, huge Shehalian with her snows and mists. Two or three miles of this, and then a welcome sight. The bridge and the inn, promising rest, refreshment, and other joys. Here, too, we found two other members of the party, Henderson and Dewar, who had come up the previous afternoon and spent the night comfortably in bed. Ha! The luxury! Of all places to spend a honeymoon at this time of year, this seemed the strangest. And yet, here we found a newly married couple enjoying early bliss among the bogs, boulders and snowdrifts. Let us hope the rest of their lives shall be more happily circumstanced. Ha ha ha! The view of Shehalian from here is not nearly so imposing as from more distant places. It is a huge mass of mountain, running nearly east and west, a long, high-backed ridge, descending easily eastward, but breaking down very rapidly at the other end, above Ranach. The peak is small and sharp, reaching a height of 3,547 feet, Although very certainly situated as regard to Perthshire Highlands, it is almost more isolated than any other mountain, being cut off on every side by deep glens of some width. This formation gives the best views of it from east and west, where it towers into the sky as a huge steep-sided cone that must be well known to all our members who have been upon the western bends. By nine o'clock, having demolished huge supplies of porridge and chops, we took to the wet moor, trampling through the peat hags and rank heather of Craig Dew. This surmounted, a spongy morass occupied us for some time, 
and then we rose through the boulders and burned heather. Here we got fairly among the grouse and blue leaves, and high overhead the curlews wheeled in air with wailing cry and great commotion. An hour carried us across the three ridges to the foot of Shehalian proper. High, high above she soared aloft in the thin mists. The lower slopes clad with tangled heather, moss and boulder, and dusted over with the slushy snow of a previous day. Far above there appeared to be a plateau of some width, and beyond it rose the roof of the mountain. A steep slope, five hundred feet high, for the most part covered by the heavy snow wreaths of winter. Where snow was absent, the mountain showed steep pitched trains of huge boulders. Tangled heather as high as the knee, hidden rocks and soft snow a couple of inches deep on a steep incline reduced our pace considerably. But when at the end of half an hour we halted, we had risen several hundred feet and commanded a wide, desolate prospect. Our advent was a source of much astonishment to the mountain hares. These comical beasts, nearly all in their white winter coats, were immensely numerous. They frisked all about us, and a whole regiment of them steadily retired before us to the higher regions. They had a fashion of sitting up on their hind legs and blinking at us until we got within about mm, 30 yards, at which point they turned around and lobbed away over the rocks till curiosity prompted fresh scrutiny. The final slope was steep and slippery, but we recovered breath among the hillocks and hollows of the plateau at the top of it. Oh, it was very wintry up here. The hollows were full of deep drift, and everywhere there was an inch or two of fresh snow. The pools were frozen over, and the bitter east wind cut like a blunt razor. The vegetation had a beautiful aspect. Each blade of grass and spike of club moss was feathered on the weather side with tiny spicules of ice. Long, long pendants hung from the rocks, and the boulders were covered with fairy-like frosty incrustations. But the artwork of the fairies had a poor chance in the encounter with our ruthless hobnailed boots as we pushed our way across to the last ridge. Its lower edge was easy, but presently we set foot on the snow blanket proper, the white loincloth flung across the back of the mountain. It was very steep, smooth, shining and hard surfaced soaring with a sharp edge high into the grey sky above us, trailing down beneath a graceful curve of dazzling whiteness. Like a file of flies, on the overhang of a tablecloth, we scrambled up, kicking hard into the firm snow, each man bending at his breast forward to the slope and panting and puffing muchly. But... After a few minutes of heavy work, we crowned the ridge to see the snow slope of similar steepness plunging down the further side. Whew. It is easy now. Turning westward, we follow the ridge that rises in front, with a deep, deep glen on either hand. All the hollows are filled with deep drift. All the hummocks are piles of granite boulders, half buried in snow and ice. Up we rise, up and up slowly, and quite suddenly we come upon a little rocky mound surmounted by a low cairn, and beyond it our mountain falls fast to the west. We are at the top. And there you have the great Shehali.
have enjoyed looking at stories of Shehalian so much that we're doing a second part of this episode for all of the magic and fairies and oracles of this marvellous mountain. I feel like there's something tremendously powerful about Shehalian, that it can be a muse for both science and legend. And our next episode will cover all of this incredible legend. Shehalian allows us to appreciate not only the huge powers of mountain building, from plate tectonics to glaciation which formed and carved the mountain, leaving her standing alone in central Scotland, but also the power of the human mind, of curiosity, of ingenuity and the pettiness of geological infighting, which sought her out in her isolated position and her perfectly carved sides. Together, these powers were able to answer some really huge questions about the place we humans live. This wonderful planet Earth. A huge ellipsoid of minerals and metals flying through space. And Shehalian allowed us to understand the wildness of that just a little bit more. That was very poetic, Jenny. So let's finish this on a darling poem by C.A. Sage from Fife, who submitted this to the Dundee Evening Telegraph. It was published in late August 1910, but it feels very endless. Apparently there are as many poems about Shehalian as there are podcasters in the world, Annie. Probably more. (laughs) Shall we get Kyle in to do this one? Yes, let's get Kyle in. Sweet Kyle. Hello, welcome. Hello there. Welcome. Oh, sweet is the breath of the heather-clad hillside. The smell of the wind as it blows through the trees, and sweet loud and clear in the vale far and wide, is the call of the curlew borne low on the breeze. The hill with its golden-clad summit is nestling its head beneath the dew-laden nightcap of mist, and low on its shoulders the pine trees are rustling and patiently waiting their turn to be kissed. Thank you so much, Kyle. It's so great to have you back on the podcast. No, thank you for having me. It's really lovely to be back and reading something for you all. It's really lovely. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for listening to Stories of Scotland. We absolutely adore making this podcast and we simply make it because of the amount of incredible support and listeners we have. So this is all because of you that Jenny has to be a pheasant sometimes. <laughs> You can support us making this podcast on social media or by giving us a cheeky wee review. We read absolutely all of the reviews uh, from everywhere in the world and they really make our day whenever we get new ones. If you want to go another step up on the magical mountain of appreciation and access some bonus content, then you can also support us on Patreon. Thank you to all of our Patreons and we'll give a little shout out to our new ones who are helping us climb the mountain of building this podcast into something extra special. Hello and welcome to Meg and Marty, Will, Stephen and Arabella. If you would like to become a Patreon, you can go to www.patreon.com slash stories of Scotland. Thank you all so much for your support. We really value having you join us on this journey and the shiny stickers are coming along nicely. Join us for Shehalian part two very soon. Slangeva. Slangeva. <laughs> well done, Pheasant Jenny. <sighs> Here we go. Geology, make it fun, make it exciting, make them want more. Rocks, rocks, geology, geology, astrology, mathematician. Ooh. The bar is low. Oh, that's the only reason I knew what a plumb bob was before I went to university to study surveying. And they were like, this is a plumb bob. And the whole world clicked into place with me that day. Didn't teach you that in Latin class. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Jenny. <laughs> yeah, you're like the little thin crust of history, and I'm like the deep core of time. <laughs> and in real life, I'm the crusty one, so <laughs> it makes perfect sense. The wondrous rock, 
that then was carried on. Sorry, the one just work. You said rock. You <laughs> thinking about that. rocks. <laughs> I've just got rocks on the mind. Please, can you be a pheasant? Um. <clears throat> <laughs> Pheasant politely coughing, Jenny. I can't, I can't do it. Okay, wait a minute. I'm a pheasant, I'm a pheasant in a field. I'm a pheasant in a field and I'm looking for a bloody pheasant. Oh, oh, nature. (coughs) 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 Just embody a pheasant a little bit more, Jenny. you're just trying to politely get someone's attention by doing a like <laughs> excuse me that probably would have been more accurate <laughs> oh. okay <Whew>. sorry <laughs> to defezant myself <laughs> yep forget stories of scotland this podcast just gonna become stories of shahalian from now on <laughs> also <laughs> split <laughs> <laughs> Fine, 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 fine. <laughs> Sorry, no, no, no. On you go, on you go. I'll no, laugh. No, I'll laugh. No, I can laugh. I can laugh. No, you can't. No, don't even, don't bother. No, it's gone. You just made me be a pheasant. You just made me be a pheasant, Annie. <laughs> <laughs> can you do a pheasant noise? <laughs> See how, see how dehumanizing that is, Annie. <laughs> <laughs>